Major funding for Earth Revealed was provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. This is San Francisco, the city by the bay, an alluring location not only to the 800,000 who live here, but to millions of others who have ridden cable cars up and down its hilly streets, crossed over its spectacular bridges, and been charmed by its unique combination of enticing qualities. Apart from its many other attributes, the San Francisco Bay Area boasts two major league baseball teams, the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland Athletics. Late on the afternoon of October 17, 1989, the Giants and the A's prepare to do battle in the third game of their Crosstown World Series matchup. Some 90 kilometers to the south, another battle is about to be played out by two underground titans known as the North American and the Pacific Plates. A section of the San Andreas Fault that marks the boundary between these tectonic plates has been locked in a kind of stalemated tug of war since 1906. In a matter of moments, that great standoff will come to an abrupt end. In the process, reducing America's favorite pastime to little more than a trifling footnote. But for the thousands of fans packed into Candlestick Park on this October afternoon, and for the millions watching the Fall Classic at home on television, there's no indication of any imminent danger. Until four minutes after five o'clock Pacific Daylight Time. In large part because of the World Series, television crews blanket the entire San Francisco region, and only minutes after a powerful earthquake has ripped through the Bay Area, the first images of horror begin to emerge. In the frantic minutes that follow the quake, few geologic details are known. What is rapidly becoming clear, however, is that a disaster of enormous proportions has occurred. We've had serious problems, obviously. Go home and secure your residence. Shut off the gas, shut off electricity, store water, prepare for aftershocks, prepare for three days of no services. You got 90 minutes of light left. You better make use of your time. As fire and paramedic units rush to provide assistance to quake victims, scientists at the United States Geological Survey in Menlo Park, California, hastily convene to begin analyzing the quake as well as to dispense information to the media and the general public. Uh, yes, you can. So this, we're just asking for two lines, because you aren't... The quake's magnitude is pegged at 7.1 on the Richter scale, meaning this has been a powerful earthquake, capable of causing serious damage to both people and property. 
Most of the world's attention remains focused on damage in and around San Francisco, such as here on the Nimitz Freeway, where it is feared that scores of motorists have died. And here in the posh marina district, where prized real estate has been twisted into grotesque shapes. But apart from select localized areas that have been severely damaged, most of San Francisco has come through the quake in relatively good condition. There are problems, of course. Delays in both transportation and communication are widespread, but the city is still functioning. Unfortunately, the situation some distance to the south is less encouraging. The quake's epicenter is located near a peak in the Santa Cruz Mountains called Loma Prieta. And it is communities closest to Loma Prieta like Santa Cruz, Watsonville, and Los Gatos that have actually been hit the hardest. This right here is the front porch. There is the house down the hill. Or what's left of it, shall we say. Uh, Harry and I were in the dining room, each of us uh, tending to our little chores there, phoning, and uh, when we uh, felt it, so we knew right away to go to the doorway, the traditional uh, earthquake uh, movement, and wait for it to subside. Well, it didn't, and then we continued on down the hallway to the front door behind me, and uh, we were thrown to the floor, and uh, ended up on the floor flying in another doorway when it finally stopped. Only one person was in the house, and that was one of my tenants. She was up in that, in that little alcove up there, that nook where the two windows are. And her roommate had just come down here to unload something from the car when it hit, and she could look up and see her roommate, you know, just kind of swaying with the house, and the, meanwhile the porch is falling down, and the house slipped out the foundation, and she's screaming, and it was horrifying. Within minutes after the quake hits, relief efforts are underway. The official relief apparatus includes various groups and agencies from all levels of government. Their immediate goal is to provide assistance, especially food, shelter, and medical attention wherever it is needed. In the face of tremendous devastation, local, state, and federal officials respond as quickly as they can. Still, there is a sense of frustration shared by nearly everyone associated with the relief operation. You know, you'd like to go in there and feel like you could, you know, move the concrete, get the vehicles out, do what you can in your rescue efforts anyway, but if you look at the structure and see the magnitude of the problem, you sit back for a moment and you've got to realize that it's not going to be resolved immediately. While the official response is well coordinated, there's clearly too much damage for public agencies alone to adequately address. Fortunately, as often happens in the face of natural disaster, there is an outpouring of support from private citizens. Relief organizations like the Red Cross help galvanize this sentiment into action. And a strong volunteer effort stretching from Santa Cruz to San Francisco quickly takes shape. The young people were just wonderful how they helped us. People we never knew and they never knew us, but they carried us in their arms down the, the stairs and they didn't leave us one moment. As relief efforts continue, Geologists comb the surface area around Loma Prieta, collecting data which will help them better understand this earthquake. Ironically, the efficiency of the repair crews poses something of a threat to the work of investigating geologists. The cities and counties and state governments are very efficient at fixing things. So, for example, damage to roads and uh, other structures are fixed very quickly so that you lose a lot of the data uh, if you don't get out there and, and record it as soon as possible. Another major obstacle facing the teams of investigators is weather. Both wind and rain can wipe out vital evidence following earthquakes. 
Apart from weather and prompt repair operations, the U.S. Geological Survey is forced to deal with one additional problem, damage to its own facilities. Loma Prieta disrupted our uh, network operations for several hours here in the office. We lost power, as did most of the community, for about six hours. We have emergency generators, and we were able to run our essential computers and the tape recorders uh, on those generators. Um, many computers that, that weren't powered by the emergency power uh, were, were down, and, and many functions that, that we wanted to perform were impossible. But despite some problems with its equipment, the USGS continues to operate effectively. For example, the steps that had been taken to ensure that the um, seismic monitoring network stayed alive worked, worked well. Uh, we really did not lose um, any downtime uh, from the earthquake, and we were able to essentially provide continuous information um, to the public and to local and state officials about what was happening uh, during the earthquake. Really the most important information to relay to the public after an earthquake is the fact that aftershocks are expected to occur and the, and the question of how long we expect them to occur and, and what kind of additional hazard they represent. Uh, during the Loma Prieta earthquake sequence we were able to speak to the public every day uh, reminding uh, everyone that aftershocks are likely to occur and that uh, although we can't predict the time of, of the aftershocks, the first week or two is the most dangerous time and aftershocks can continue for several months after the main shock. As research efforts continue, geologists begin to recognize that there are a number of surprising aspects to this quake. This looks more like the left lateral. Yeah, you, you put this back. One of the interesting it. things about the Lone Prieta earthquake was that the fault that broke was not the vertical um, strike slip fault that we tend to think of as characterizing the San Andreas fault. Geologists normally expect the two sides of the San Andreas fault to slip past each other horizontally, with the west side moving to the northwest. This did, in fact, happen, but the west side also moved vertically, riding up on the east side between one and two meters. What also catches the attention of geologists is that the focus of the quake occurred 18 kilometers beneath the surface, surprisingly deep for California earthquakes. Perhaps because the quake was so deep-seated, no rupture broke the surface along the fault but numerous fissures resulted from landslides triggered by the shaking. The earthquake was also surprisingly brief, given its great power, with shaking felt for only about eight seconds. The extent of the damage in parts of San Francisco and Oakland, a full 90 kilometers from the epicenter, also surprises most people. And yet the event itself was hardly a surprise. Earthquakes along the San Andreas Fault have no doubt occurred throughout its 30 million year history. Whenever the plates on either side of the fault lock and strain against one another, a breaking point is eventually reached. And as the plates lurch past one another, an earthquake occurs. But there's another reason why this particular quake was not unexpected. Scientists have known for several years that the 1,200 kilometer long San Andreas Fault is actually composed of individual discrete segments. Geophysicists have calculated the probability of major earthquakes in each of these regions, along with the maximum likely magnitude at each location. The Loma Prieta earthquake occurred along one of the six fault segments considered most likely to sustain a magnitude 6.5 or larger event within the 30-year interval between 1988 and 2018. Once the shaking stopped, many people almost felt a sense of relief, assuming that they would no longer have to worry about another major earthquake during the foreseeable future. 
However, the Loma Prieta earthquake was not the so-called big one that geologists and millions of Californians have been waiting for. We know that there will be future large earthquakes in the Bay Area, probably within the next few decades. And they're much likely to be closer to the centers of population and to shake those centers of population more strongly than Loma Prieta and actually the, the uh, strong shaking should last longer. As terrifying as this tremor was, geologists call it a moderate rather than a great earthquake. The magnitude of the 1906 quake, which also shook the San Francisco Bay region, has been estimated at 8.3, meaning it released about 60 times more energy than the Loma Prieta quake. Nonetheless, there is a chilling irony that links the two events. When California staged an international exposition in 1915, the city of San Francisco wanted to divert world attention from the devastating quake that had rocked the area nine years earlier. In so doing, it hoped to market itself as a viable Pacific port. This led to the building of exposition structures in the Marina District. The materials selected to fill in the shallow water of the marina were a combination of rubble from the 1906 quake and uncompacted mud and sand. Seventy-four years later, this community, built atop the rubble of one earthquake, would suffer catastrophe from another. Those very soft um, surface uh, deposits um, shook very uh, violently and in fact they failed. You had what we call a liquefaction where, where the ground essentially loses the ability to support loads and so that buildings that are sitting on that material sunk into the ground and shifted. The uh, foundations of the building shifted. And the reason for that is, is because as the earthquake wave moved away from the epicenter, uh, when it hit this, this this geology, this loose, unconsolidated soil, the, uh, the ground motion actually was amplified or increased five times what it was maybe a mile up on solid bedrock up here. So geologists have understood in the last 10 years uh, where to build, not only how to build, but where to build. And, and geology, we have maps showing where areas uh, of, of loosely consolidated uh, uh, ground and this is one of them here. And if we look all around the edge of the San Francisco Bay, uh, downtown the Embarcadero, the Embarcadero Freeway, south of Market, uh, these are small packets of, uh, of liquefiable soils, and these are where uh, we have the most documented damage uh, in the entire San Francisco area. The fact that geologists and many public officials have known for some time which areas are most vulnerable to earthquakes is of little comfort to those whose lives have been devastated by this disaster. But as the focus shifts from the horror of Loma Prieta to the inevitability of future quakes, the race to increase our knowledge and somehow prepare for these seismic giants intensifies. So it's been a fairly long the approach that generally attracts the most attention and yet continues to be the most elusive is earthquake prediction. It to me that we saw some interesting creep at Middle Mountain. Scientists are studying everything from magnetic fields to groundwater levels and deformation of the Earth's crust in an effort to come up with a formula that can accurately predict earthquakes. While some promising work has been done, a definite earthquake prediction technique has yet to be developed. The Loma Prieta quake, however, has contributed what may be an important clue to the prediction riddle. At Stanford University, physicist Anthony Fraser Smith studies low frequency electromagnetic waves. Um, and everything will be very solid. Right, in, the in part to avoid extraneous signals from the San Francisco area, Fraser Smith looked south to the Santa Cruz Mountains to find a suitable location in which to place his research equipment. What he didn't realize was that the spot he chose would turn out to be almost directly at the epicenter 
of the Loma Prieta earthquake. Our, our first thought after the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake was that uh, we probably would never see our equipment again because there was a lot of damage uh, all, all in that area. Power had been lost, uh, yeah, communication nice had been nice lost, the telephone lines somewhere. were down. We just sure didn't know what had happened right down there. For the Remarkably, Fraser Smith's equipment survived intact, and when one of his colleagues checked out the data that had been recorded just prior to the quake, he found something unexpected and quite extraordinary. There were very big signals coming through, and the thing that most excited him was uh, a big increase about three hours before the earthquake, uh, where uh, the signals had grown so large that the computer that runs our system was putting out warning messages saying that the signals were now so large that uh, we no longer could trust the data. They were not, the measurements were actually smaller than the real signals were. They were no longer capable of following the real signals. What is intriguing about these fluctuations in the electromagnetic signals is that they may have been related to the Loma Prieta earthquake. Fraser Smith is quick to point out, however, that it's too early to claim that they can definitely be considered earthquake precursors. While it's uncertain whether Fraser Smith's research will lead to an effective method of earthquake prediction, there's no doubt that something needs to be done to minimize the level of destruction that large quakes cause. Of particular concern are earthquakes that occur along faults situated close to major population centers. For example, the Hayward Fault, which lies just east of San Francisco Bay. If an earthquake of the same magnitude as the Loma Prieta quake were to occur on the Hayward Fault, a population 15 times larger would be at risk. Engineers at the University of California at Berkeley contend that rapid, unchecked growth in such areas reflects a dangerous lack of planning. The Hayward Fault ran exactly along, was the freeway, the Warren Freeway ran along the fault. And then there are most of the hospitals are along there. There is a Navy hospital and many, and many schools are there. This is what I mean, the lack or a disaster prevention policy. These buildings should not be built there. These highways should not be built. And yet hospitals, schools, and highways have been built in the vicinity of dangerous faults. Clearly, the prospect of tearing these structures down and relocating the millions of people who utilize them is not feasible. The most practical alternative seems to be retrofitting existing structures so that they will be more likely to survive a major earthquake. Most casualties associated with earthquakes are caused not by the quakes themselves, but by the failure of buildings, bridges, and other structures. This is one of the most serious problems. The problem what to do with buildings or a structure that we know that are building on soil that will suffer damage. At the moment, anything that we will do there will be a very expensive. It's a very expensive operation. Can be done. However, will require a tremendous economic effort. There is yet another strategy for minimizing the impact of earthquakes a seismic early warning system, still in the experimental stage, that was installed following the Loma Prieta earthquake. With this system, the instant a large earthquake is recorded, sensors in the ground transmit a signal to receiving stations throughout the area. You're taking advantage of the idea that once an earthquake occurs and it's detected, you can essentially outrace the seismic waves that are propagating through the ground by sending a radio signal ahead. And so the farther away you are, the more time of warning that you have. The actual time saved by such a system might only amount to 10 or 20 seconds, but this could be long enough to divert or temporarily immobilize public transportation systems or to simply warn people to take cover and possibly save their lives. So I think it has 
some possibilities and the state and local officials are, are evaluating how such a system might best be used in future earthquakes. For the residents of the San Francisco Bay region, the impact of the Loma Prieta earthquake was enormous. 63 people lost their lives, and another 3,800 were injured. More than 28,000 homes and businesses were damaged, and the overall financial cost was about $6 billion. Still, the results were far less catastrophic than they might have been. Had the World Series not been in progress, more people would probably have been on the Nimitz Freeway when it collapsed. And if the quake had occurred closer to a densely populated area, the death toll could have been in the thousands. While earthquake prediction may never become a practical tool, we can use what we know about earthquakes to limit their impact on our lives. For example, we can avoid building in areas where the ground will rupture or subside during a quake, and in areas where liquefaction is likely to occur. We can design new buildings and homes to withstand the shaking of earthquakes. Old buildings can be reinforced or torn down. The contents of all structures should be secured to avoid the injuries caused by toppling furniture and falling objects. We can also prepare for earthquakes by storing emergency supplies at home, in our cars, and at work, and by arranging for earthquake plans with our friends, our families, and coworkers. And finally, we can require our elected representatives to create a comprehensive earthquake policy to strengthen building codes and public structures. Such a policy would employ the best current technology to ensure that highways, bridges, and dams are able to withstand the earthquakes that we know will come. We understand why earthquakes happen. We can sometimes forecast the general location of the epicenter, the intensity of the shaking, and even where the earth will rupture and subside. But knowledge alone isn't enough we must have the collective will to apply this knowledge and to finance the changes we know must be made. Only then can we make our world, if not earthquake proof, at least relatively earthquake safe. Major funding for Earth Revealed was provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. For more information on the college telecourse, video cassettes, off-air videotaping, and books based on the series, call 1-800-LEARNER. Major funding for Earth Revealed was provided by the Annenberg CPB Project.
For most of human history, the power of civilization has been human power. H.G. Wells describes life during this period in his book, Outline in History. Where a weight had to be lifted, men lifted it. Where a rock had to be quarried, men chipped it out. Where a field had to be plowed, men and oxen plowed it. The Roman equivalent of the steamship was the galley, with its banks of sweating rowers. For thousands of years, across cultures and continents, human survival and the advancement of society have depended on physical strength. In fact, it was not until the 18th century, about the time of the American Revolution, that a change began to take place. It's interesting that this change is also referred to by historians as a revolution, the Industrial Revolution. It began in England, where a series of simple mechanical inventions made it possible to harness the power of gravity and heat. At first, this power-driven machinery was too crude and inefficient to be of much use. But as the 19th century unfolded and mechanical technology improved, it became obvious that much of the work done by humans and their animals could be done faster, cheaper, and often better by machines. Human power, quote, was needed now only where choice and intelligence had to be exercised. The drudge, on whom all previous civilizations had rested, the creature of mere obedience, had become unnecessary to the welfare of mankind. Today, we've come to realize that our quality of life and our future existence on this planet depend on how we exercise this human power of choice and intelligence. During the last century, and largely as a result of the Industrial Revolution, much of the Earth's supply of geologic resources has been severely depleted by the almost insatiable appetite of our energy-hungry lifestyle and a growing population. In fact, most geologic fuels, including oil, natural gas, coal, and uranium, are considered to be non-renewable. Deposits of these materials form extremely slowly when compared to a human time scale. At present rates of consumption, we can expect that sometime in the next few generations, these materials will be unavailable or simply too costly to use. So at this critical time in our history, human power again becomes vitally important. Creative and enterprising scientists are using their knowledge and talents to search for new forms of energy. In the meantime, geologists are working to locate and to more efficiently develop existing sources of energy. Of all Earth's geologic resources, none is more prized nor in shorter supply than oil. Oil may be found in ancient marine strata as much as a half billion years old. Along the margins of continents, the seas teem with microscopic life. As these organisms die and settle to the sea floor, they may be buried by sediment, which protects them from rapid decay. As this organic matter becomes more deeply buried, it is gradually transformed into oil and natural gas by heat and pressure. It typically takes millions of years for this to occur. Petroleum exploration requires locating the geologic structures that trap oil and gas. These structures are usually marked by changes in density underground. Geologists are able to detect these changes by bouncing seismic waves through Earth's crust. And you have to keep in mind that down in the subsurface of the Earth, the rocks have different hardnesses. And when you have two formations or two rock layers that have a different hardness and they're in juxtaposition or in contact with each other, then you can get a reflection back. Just like looking into a mirror, you get a reflection of your face. Just like the sonogram reflects off of the baby's body and returns its image to the surface. Seismic waves are artificially generated above potential oil-bearing rocks. We have a truck called a vibrosize truck that actually shakes the ground. Uh, a vibrosize truck would shake the ground in an up and down fashion, much like a jackhammer on a construction site shakes the ground. We may uh, drill a hole five foot or 200 foot down into the ground and load it with five to 20 pounds of dynamite and set the dynamite off, creating that shock wave that we need. These shock waves are detected by electronic receivers known as geophones. The geophones are laid out in a line or grid pattern over the area to be mapped. 
The information recorded by the geophones is processed by a computer, which in turn generates a reflection seismogram. Uh, you got about 30 seconds. And what you see on this reflection seismogram is a series of reflections. And those are occurring where that source that goes down through the earth, that shock wave, bounces off of the subsurface rocks and comes back to the surface and is recorded at the geophones. So we see images of the subsurface. Several seismograms are combined to produce maps showing the depths to oil bearing formations. Now that subsurface depth map would portray a structure in the subsurface and that would be much like a topographic map portrays a mountain or a structure on the surface of the earth. So once we've done that, if we ascertain that there's a structure or a trap down there that has the capacity to hold hydrocarbons and all the other things fit into the picture with respect to source, migration, timeliness, and reservoir rock, then we would make a determination of whether or not that prospect was economic. If it was economic and we were able to get the land, then we would possibly drill a well and hopefully have a large discovery. Arco's site in Bakersfield, California, is thought to contain over 100 million barrels of oil in a deposit that is roughly 38 feet thick and 2,000 feet long. Although more than a thousand wells have pierced this reservoir, a significant portion of the oil still remains underground. The oil actually isn't contained in, in huge pools underneath the ground. Really, it's contained within these very small pore spaces of sedimentary rocks like sandstones and limestones. The flow openings through these rocks are really quite small and um, it takes a tremendous amount of pressure to force the oil uh, and gas through the pore spaces in the rocks. In a new untapped field, the natural pressure of the formation may be enough to drive the oil to the surface. But as wells draw oil from the ground, that pressure drops and extraction becomes more difficult. Typically, as much as two-thirds of the oil remains underground because of this drop in pressure. But a new technique called horizontal drilling is now being used to coax oil from partially depleted reserves. The first step in perforating a horizontal well is to run long pieces of pipe called perforating guns into the well. These perforating guns contain jet charges that will blow holes in the pipe. The guns are run into the well on the end of well tubing and once they're properly positioned across from the formations that we want to perforate, they're detonated by using water pressure in the well to ignite a firing head that starts the, the firing chain all the way down the guns. The guns fire over a 1,300 foot interval in a split second. Horizontal drilling techniques allow engineers to penetrate shallow deposits that would have been too expensive to tap using vertical methods. This lone horizontal drill rig has produced approximately 900 barrels per day for the last seven months. To achieve the same production rate with conventional drilling techniques would require four times as many wells at a 40% increase in cost. Horizontal drilling is going to be used more and more in the future to try to get the last bit out of uh, a lot of oil fields. In fact, some people estimate that Within, a, within 10 years, about a third of the wells that are drilled are going to be horizontal. As the technology improves, the cost of the horizontal drilling is going to become more competitive with uh, the conventional vertical wells also. And uh, ultimately, I think it's going to make a, a big contribution to the uh, recovery of oil throughout the world. While the potential of horizontal drilling remains promising, Scientists have adopted ever more exotic techniques in the quest for geologic resources. Through a process known as remote sensing, satellites circling high above Earth gather data from large areas of the planet's surface. 
This is, of course, in contrast to the way we did it before, which is a person would map a little postage stamp area here and then another area over here, and then some bold soul would come and collect all these postage stamps of information and draw lines between them and say, okay, this is the integrated map of Oklahoma or, or uh, the United States. And in the very course of doing that connection between the postage stamps, we quite often would lose the kinds of information and the kinds of insights that we were really trying to gain by virtue of, of integrating or of, of compiling a large uh, map of a large area. So what uh, remote sensing has done, or satellite remote sensing particularly, has given us a, a chance to look at the interrelationship between uh, widely separated uh, features and see those in a, in a way that we've not been able to see before. Satellites detect these features by measuring the electromagnetic radiation emitted or reflected by Earth's surface. Electromagnetic radiation consists of a continuous spectrum of energy. Visible light comprises one small part of this spectrum, which also includes higher energy gamma rays, X-rays, and ultraviolet radiation. At the other end of the spectrum lie lower energy radio waves, microwaves, and infrared radiation. Human vision is restricted to bands of visible light. Satellites, however, can peer into the realm of the invisible and see the full range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Another aspect of the, of the value of the data are that you're recording data in discrete spectral bands. Uh, a lot of these bands we don't even see with our eyes. So what we have available to us then is information in areas that are beyond, spectrally beyond, what we can see with our own sensors, our own eyes. Along with their wide field of view, this ability of satellites to detect different wavelengths of light provides scientists with a unique perspective on our planet. So we really were created to take advantage of that technology. And the idea was that the company would be multidisciplinary, that is we'd have geologists and foresters and oceanographers and climatologists and physicists and so on and so forth. Um, that idea has, has persisted. Uh, almost from day one, uh, an awful lot of our business came from geology, particularly geologic exploration. Uh, it's an area for which remote sensing is, is just perfectly suited. In geology, as you would expect, the bulk of our clients have been oil and gas exploration uh, companies, mineral exploration companies, and people uh, and groups who are involved in, in groundwater exploration. Recently, a group of oil companies asked the Earth Satellite Corporation to investigate the potential for oil and gas reserves in Pakistan. The idea was to get an integrated notion of oil and gas occurrence in Pakistan, of course with the hope of, one, finding extensions of things that were known, and two, uh, hopefully finding areas that had potential that really had not been uh, examined in any detail or drilled. For that matter. The data gathered by satellite was beamed back to Earth as a stream of computerized information. It did not look like a picture of Pakistan upon its arrival. Because we record all of the information as a bunch of numbers, we can then use those numbers and apply mathematical techniques to them which enhance the information or combine the information in different ways to get a product we want. Do you reckon those are little field boundaries there? These little different features on the Earth there, are, are sensitive to different uh, right. portions right. of the electromagnetic spectrum. Therefore, if you were interested in vegetation, we would use a different band combination. Or if you're interested in urban areas, we'd, use, we'd select the band combination based on that. Whatever you want to get out of the imagery. By creating a composite picture from individual images, the imaging team is able to see geologic features and regional relationships that were not apparent when the area was studied on a picture-by-picture -picture basis. Producing a mosaic is a complex task. 
Colors and contrast must be matched to minimize the patchwork effect. Once all that is done, we take that composite print, the mosaic itself of all the scenes, we copy those in a copy camera. And then we make an enlarged print for the cart lab so that they can add annotation. Once the annotation is added, then we make a final print that has the legend and all the information the geologist would like to overlay on that. When geologists examined the features of Pakistan on a large scale, they were quite surprised. There are a series of folds in Pakistan that look like, you know, kind of the wrinkles under your eye after you've been up too long. And uh, the conclusion was that these really marked areas where we had thicker sequences of sediment. That is, these were old basins. And what we concluded was that we were really looking at a rather complex margin of an old continent. The fact that the mosaic revealed features and relationships that had not been detected from the analysis of single images or from field investigations prompted geologists to seek answers to questions that might never have been asked. And as we delved into the literature, we found that there was good evidence that, in fact, the Indian plate itself had bumped into Eurasia up on the, the northwestern corner and then rotated counterclockwise. So insights like that become uh, just absolutely uh, invaluable in trying to, to unravel the deformational history that may bear on where hydrocarbons might be, uh, be located today. Well, we were able to come up with a number of other areas that have not been examined that look like they have a very, very large potential. Creative techniques like reflection seismology, horizontal drilling, and satellite remote sensing not only make the development of existing oil and gas reserves more efficient, they also allow geologists to search for new oil fields more effectively. But as powerful as these technologies are, they represent only a short-term solution to our energy problems. And regardless of how efficient our oil extraction capabilities become, the widespread use of petroleum and other fossil fuels will continue to aggravate a number of serious environmental and public health problems. The simple, inescapable fact is that the world's supply of petroleum is finite and non-renewable. The best estimate of global oil reserves indicates that we've already used about half of the world's commercially available oil. And oil that's now forming in sedimentary rocks won't be available for millions of years. It's safe to say that many of us living today will see an end to the widespread use of petroleum as a fuel for transportation and for generating electricity. Shrinking supplies, rising prices, and the environmental cost of using fossil fuels has prompted a search for other forms of energy. And here, Human power has again responded to alter the course of our future by creating new machines and new technologies to capture the intensity of the sun, harness the force of the wind, and use the heat of the Earth's interior. These energy sources are fundamentally different from fossil fuels. They produce little or no pollution, and they are, for the most part, renewable. These sources of energy have the potential to play a vital role in our future for generations to come. One alternative to fossil fuels, which has been in use for some time, is hydropower. Water rushing through passageways in dams spins enormous turbines, which generate electricity. A more recent development is the wind farm. Vast numbers of air turbines stretched across hillsides convert the force of the wind into electric power. Light from the sun is yet another alternative source of energy. With the use of photovoltaic cells, sunlight generates electricity. It is also used to heat water and buildings. Each of these alternatives to fossil fuels is driven by Earth's external heat engine, the energy of the sun transformed into wind, light, or running water. But Earth's internal heat engine can provide energy as well. Hot rock in the shallow crust has been tapped to produce geothermal power. 
In volcanic regions, geothermal energy is used to heat thousands of homes and places of work. More commonly, however, it is used to generate electricity. Geothermal sites around the world, there's quite a few. There's 250 plants operating in 16 countries on six continents. So it's widespread. The first geothermal power plant that actually produced electricity, like we are here, was in 1904 in Larbordello, Italy. So it's an old uh, technology that's been applied in a lot of other places. The United States, uh, per se, did not start until recently with the, the increase in energy costs. The geothermal energy contained in the upper five kilometers of Earth's crust is said to be 40 million times greater than the energy contained in oil and gas reserves. But only a small fraction of this energy can be exploited economically. One area that is being explored for its geothermal potential is the Imperial Valley of California. The crust is normally relatively thick in most places, but in an area like this where we are today, it's thin, it's only about 18,000 feet. So we're very close to the liquid rock within the earth, and that heat is very close to the surface, and water in the ground contacts that magma, brings heat to the surface, and we can produce it. And it's in areas like this where you get geothermal energy, where we can use it. If you drill deep enough anywhere in the world, you can get the heat, but here we can drill shallow and get the heat. The magma beneath the Imperial Valley heats up groundwater, causing it to rise through the crust. As the groundwater reaches the surface, it can flash, or instantaneously vaporize to steam. This steam is then used to drive turbines, which generate electricity. But the groundwater contains salts, which corrode turbines and clog pipes. These dissolved salts, called brine, must first be removed to purify the steam. As it enters the plant, it goes into a large separation vessel where we take steam off the top and brine off the bottom. This first steam comes off at about 110 to 120 pounds, and it will go to a high-pressure turbine. It will spin the turbine and make electricity. The brine that comes off the bottom of that vessel goes to another separation where more steam is removed down to almost atmospheric pressure like we breathe. That steam then goes into another part of a turbine, makes more electricity. It's then condensed and put back with the brine or put into a cooling tower to generate cooling for the condensers. Sometimes artificial means are used to vaporize the groundwater. This brine, as, as it exists in the ground, the pressure in the reservoir is not enough for the brine to flow to the surface. So what we do is after we drill a well, we will induce it to flow with nitrogen gas. We will pump gas into it, which will start it to boiling, to flashing, and on its own it will generate, much like a teapot, it'll start to boil, and if you get enough heat, it'll boil out the top. Well, these wells will generate their own steam and they'll produce to the surface. Geothermal energy is a stable source of power with relatively low environmental impact. Environmentally, geothermal is one of the most benign energy sources we have. The only two that might be better than that would be wind power and photovoltaic cells. The major shortcomings to geothermal is it has a high capital investment, so you have got to have a lot of capital to get started. That's probably one of the biggest drawbacks to it. The second drawback is that we're really limited. It, there, there are only finite areas that can be developed. Only a few places have the proper combination of heat, geologic structure, and clean groundwater to produce geothermal energy. And since heat is replaced quite slowly in rocks, geothermal stations usually tap all useful energy within just a few decades. Individually, neither geothermal, hydro, wind, nor solar power can substitute for the world's supply of fossil fuels. But collectively, they can make a significant contribution to our energy requirements. And as the environmental costs of burning fossil fuels escalate and reserves dwindle, 
the need to continue developing new sources of energy becomes even greater. As we approach the 21st century, the fact that Earth's geologic resources are in finite supply is a reality that affects us all. There are very real and very predictable limits to the resources available for our use. And the primary reason for these limits is not supply, it's demand. It took four million years for Earth's population to reach two billion. The third billion was added in just 30 years. And today, we are growing at almost 100 million people every single year. With a population and a demand for resources both exploding, we as individuals can no longer continue along a path of energy addiction and wastefulness. No longer can nations afford to take from the land while ignoring the consequences to neighboring nations and to the other forms of life with which we share this planet. And no longer can the world community afford to only view Earth through the myopic eyes of competing self-interest. We need to adopt a global view, both in our technology and our philosophy. Major funding for Earth Revealed was provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. For more information on the college telecourse, video cassettes, off-air videotaping, and books based on the series, call 1-800-LEARNER.